uh, it's important to be able to write code if you are a computer science engineer, no matter the rank that you are at. Another episode of Engineering Ajkar. Today we have someone really interesting with us. His name is Kaushik Ramchandra. He is currently a software architect at PhonePay. Before that, he worked for three years at Flipkart. He has done engineering from Usmania University and his masters were from IIIT Bangalore. What made him embark in such an interesting journey? Let's find out. I always loved maths as a kid growing up. I always loved logic as a kid growing up. And I've been writing code from when I was about 9, 10 years old. At the time I was in 4th, 5th standards. Started writing logo and then started writing Fox Pro Basic. And by the time I'm in 9th and 10th, I've already written like a host of programming languages. And so programming has always interested me as a kid. It's the things that you do as a kid that kind of sticks with you. But life takes a full circle, I suppose. I think uh, uh, about like 12 years later when in Masters, I used the same logo to run simulations on uh, producer-consumer behaviors, which is a uh, welcome change from how I use logo. But yeah, it happened organically. I, I just enjoyed it. I was, I, was, I was shown the opportunity and I think I just enjoyed it. So many, many engineers, uh, honestly, after they graduate, uh, they are very confused like some of them decide to continue uh, like uh, no. doing a master just after engineering some sure. decide to uh, just go for job directly and not think of the no. masters no. and then there are no. other people who decide to change and do something like MBA still there's a lot of confusion around what should be the next step so no. how does one decide that next step I suppose what happens is uh, most people just get into engineering because that's the regular thing to do after your 12th. And when you're somewhere on third and fourth year of engineering, people figure out how to... Uh, there, there can be many casualties along the way, as in uh, their interest will die down or, or they realize that it's just not skilled enough or they realize that it's not their calling, as cliched as it is. or or practically they realize it's not where they see themselves uh, being in 5-10 years down the line. It's not a career that they wanted. Very few people really deflect from engineering to pursue passions in their tourist sense. I guess they sort of look for career, which is unfortunate, but that's a reality of it. As for me though, uh, look, I finished engineering in 2008. I finished it at a really long time uh, in the a larger economic strata of the world. Right. And there was recession and then I had jobs, like three, four of them, uh, but then none of them happened. Uh, I'd always planned to do masters about four or five years after working. The logic then had been very simple. The logic was very simple. It was to say, uh, gain some exposure, probably earn some money so that you can pay up your master's full fee. Right. And I think that was the biggest motivation more than anything. And so that was it. And I, I suppose recession hit uh, as Providence had it. I was not jobless still, I mean, I, it was just, I was consulting with a bunch of companies and masters happened because I thought, why not now if I had to do it in four or five years. But then in retrospect, so I, I think doing masters is probably the best decision I've made in my life, in my academic life, more than wanting to write code as a 10 year old. While I could romanticize that to world's end, but I think the best decision I made is uh, doing masters. Masters was a leap of faith for me to say, you know what, uh, let me just spend two more years and then learn a bit and then see where life takes me. Turns out, uh, life takes you places personally. You, you develop a mental faculty to deal with the most complex of problems. Because, you see, you only have two years in masters, unlike bachelors. Right? In bachelors, you kind of spread yourself out. You sort of start out slow and then you kind of find your groove somewhere in second, third year. And then masters, it's get-go from the day one, right? You're there, you have only two years, you've got the best minds around you um, and you have to take as much as you can from them. That also might put a bit of an added pressure on you, but that's where your mental faculty gets toughened up. How do you not overwhelm yourself while while squeezing the maximum juice that there is to be squeezed of the offering that is in front of you? So you have done like six month internship in Sweden and it was like an internship abroad. 
do people think about PPO when they do internship abroad or is it actually just the experience that you guys are focusing on for me i think it was uh, for the experience the company that i had interned at is, was called planeto it was a gaming company one of the founders of that company martin wolfes was a, a key member in uh, ubisoft he built a company which later got acquired by ubisoft there was a scholarship in school called linus palme scholarship in my master's school and i had gotten that linus palme scholarship and instantly most people really didn't apply for it because they thought you know it'll come at a cost of a job right uh, everybody wanted to intern at a classical company like a samsung or an intel with the hope that you know there'd be a ppo at the end of it but i done it at the cost of it one thing i learned so around that time which was uh, sort of a refreshing change of pace from what i had seen in india before there was a there was a method to a madness i at, at planet earth we used to start around 8:30 in the morning and we used to sort of finish by 4 nobody slogged beyond that and we were 5x is productive um than any other place that i had seen before and i have seen since to this date so uh, like your next uh, job was in flipkart so again flipkart mm. is a very aspiration company for like techies how is it uh, the whole interview exp- uh, experience different from uh, like a pre- a person who's like going at the pressure the interview process was nothing different Not that I had given many interviews before that also. It was my first real interview, so to speak. If you discard the ones that I had done in campus to get into uh, these companies that I had gotten into, it was my first real interview. All the other jobs I had done was on the basis of my uh, profile, my GitHub profile, or the projects I have done, or the trust I've built with the guys who started those companies. And the interview was very standard. I mean. There, there was a there was a round to examine your proficiency in programming and then one in problem solving. I remember fondly this managerial round that was done, and uh, this guy said, "You know, we'd offer you this much, this much money." And I was thinking to myself, "Shit, I get salary every month. Your foundational skills are going to be discussed regardless of the position you apply for." Uh, it's important to be able to write code if you are a computer science engineer, no matter the rank that you are at. Uh, you could be a software architect. You could be a head of engineering. You could be any singer. You could be a software engineer or a senior software engineer. You should be able to write code to solve a problem. It's a bit like having to have a command on a language to be able to communicate your ideas clearly. And the only way you communicate computer science ideas clearly is to be able to write code. So, what exactly that you did in Flipkart? Like, you were software uh, senior software engineer, but what was exactly the work that you were doing in Flipkart? I was part of this team called uh, Supply Chain. Instantly, the my boss in Flipkart is still my boss today, and we really don't call him the boss; he's more like a big brother. So, uh, I started with Supply Chain. I was in the Supply Chain for three and a half years at Flipkart. I had built the Promise and logistics engine at uh, Flipkart. If you open the Flipkart product page today, you see that uh, hey, you get this delivery in two days, three days, or you get it by this time, and this is the cost A B C, right? I had built that uh, to scale it to a few hundred thousands of requests every second. That was my first venture at Flipkart, and I built the I helped build the. fulfillment ecosystem at flipkart so the the job role that was like you know uh, from a senior software engineer to a principal software engineer was there like mm-hmm. a, any difference in the 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 kind or the type of work that you were doing or the type of people you were meeting to get that thing done more than your technical skills which obviously sort of get better as you so spend more time in anything spending enough time in the system teaches you a lot more about the system about how your product things about how the company strategy things because when you sort of start in and when you don't have a lot of context you have this horse with a blinders on approach you are tackling the problem head along you're plunging head long to solve that as you sort of age in the company traditionally you figure out the compromises that are to be made i i guess that just increases as you sort of grow in a company to me i think that is the large difference Every other thing is uh, added bonus. The, you you learn a lot of new things because you're solving a lot of new problems, not with just respect to technology, but with respect to helping the company grow. I think there's this key word that people should use to measure themselves, which is efficiency. 
it's great that you're skilled it's great it's great that you're smart it's great that you bring in a lot to the table but at the end of it your skill and expertise needs to sort of align itself to help you to be efficient for the company if you're not efficient regardless of the skill you acquired it's moot that skill is moot it's like a cow's opinion it doesn't matter so like after flipkart you were uh, you came to phone pay and our phone uh-huh. pay is more uh, like a fintech uh thing mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. in in flipkart you were doing something related to supply chain so yes. was it like uh, difficult to like change to a different domain uh, how did you deal with it i i couldn't think of anything that was really difficult as such because the time i joined phone pay uh there there were already a team of 8 9 folks and the guys were all friends again we were all friends much before we joined phone pay and the the vision was already set i guess it would have been hard so as a company there were challenges uh, not with respect to or the complexity of the problems per se but the industry that we were operating in you know i come from a background where i was a completely tech heavy guy right i hadn't seen operations before phone pay before fintech because you haven't seen offline markets i i'd only seen offline markets after phone pay i'd seen how why tech is not the neither the beginning nor the end of all the problems being in fintech sort of opened my eyes to i think bursted my bubble of arrogance that tech can do anything sort of realized that if you really don't help the world around you the technology that that you kind of incubate is useless and i also realized i think technology does not have an existence of its own if it's not useful to the world around you i guess that's the massive paradigm shift in thought from what i had before phone pay so uh, like the software architect as a role it's it's an interesting role can you tell a little bit uh, more about this role there are different domains in technology per se right there's front end engineering there's back end engineering there's infrastructure there's data owing to your skill or the amount of time that you spent in the industry doing the thing over and over you build an experience and a, a faculty to solve a set of problems and in that domain you still have to think holistically so the role warrants that you be you be holistic about not a problem but a set of problems or a classification of or a class of problems uh in a particular domain for example let's talk data um, i'm just uh, sort of giving you an example talk data uh, there's a bunch of problems in data how do you how do how do you as a company use data process data keep data right and there are people who've been doing this for decades and there's there's something called an android app or an ios app right and people who've built uh, apps and they know philosophies and principles of building an app for a long time now. so the role still warrants that you work in a pocket um it wouldn't be prudent uh, even to sort of have somebody think holistically about every part of the org it's not just practical it's it's not pragmatic right? because you don't bring in everything i guess communities get built only because you can't do everything by yourself so like any last suggestion uh, one or two tips that you would like to give to our audience i'm assuming all of them are computer science engineers and if you're not also regardless of the discipline that you're in have your core skill always have your core skill uh, in in case of computer science it's being able to write code and understand how a computer works and always have a secondary skill right i'm not really talking about uh, computer science per se for example i tell jokes right and if, if i used to make this joke to people that you know if somebody ever were to fire me from my job i'm like please joke bata ke life zindagi jee lenge right so have a secondary skill so nobody really can pin you to a wall always have a secondary skill so it's not a hobby like a red proper secondary skill so you'd never be pushed to a wall and nobody can pin you down so thank you so much kaushik for this interview it was really enlightening i'm sure people who are listening to this interview will learn something out of it appreciate your time and uh, take care man stay safe